This episode is brought to you by my Fertility Management Masterclass. Master fertility awareness and improve your menstrual cycle health at the same time. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash work with me for details. That's fertilityfriday.com slash work with me. This is the Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 121. Welcome to the 121st episode of the Fertility Friday podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. Now, as you know already, I started this podcast because I believe that every woman has the right to know exactly how her body and her fertility works. And for those of you who are wanting to go deeper into the realm of fertility awareness charting and body literacy, I do have a number of programs that allow you to do just that. And I'm really excited to announce a brand new way to work with me. I'm now offering a one-time in-depth strategy session for those of you who are fairly confident in your charting, but still looking to gain a deeper understanding of your cycles. So for those of you who are wanting to go that extra step and get that customized interpretation of what your cycles are reflecting back to you about your overall health and fertility. And by the end of our 60 minute session together, you'll not only gain clarity and insight about your cycles and how they relate to your health history, but you're also going to leave with a plan concrete next steps to take to improve your cycles naturally. So make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash work with me to book your strategy session today. And today I'm very excited to welcome my guest Eileen Richmond to the show. Eileen has been a fertility awareness educator since 2001 and she first discovered fertility awareness in 1994. She is the director of the Association of Fertility Awareness Professionals, which is the only international membership organization for fertility awareness professionals. And I'm sure I could go on um, and describe, you know, all of the work that she's done, but I'm going to let her do a little bit more of her introduction. And in today's show, we're going to be talking about her role as the director of the Association of Fertility Awareness Professionals. We'll be talking about professionalism in the field and a lot more topics. So I'm really excited to have her here today. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Eileen. Thank you very much, Lisa. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you for for being here. I really appreciate you um, coming on the show. And so I'd just love for you to introduce yourself to the listeners and talk a little bit about your background, what drew you into this field of fertility awareness. Sure. Well, I think I started where pretty much everyone starts, which which is as a student, but my origins go way back <laughs> to the, the age before the internet. And nowadays, people think that fertility awareness, like in 2016, people think that fertility awareness is obscure, that it's hard to find accurate information about it, that when they do find the information, they don't get support from their healthcare professionals, that there is a conflation of fertility awareness methods with the rhythm method. Yes, all that stuff is true. But it was so much worse back before the internet, back in the 90s, 80s, um, when the non-religious methods of fertility management started to be, um, well, like started to get known. Um, So this was back in the dark ages. And uh, the way that (laughs) information was communicated, aside from traditional marketing and advertising, was with flyers. And in my community, I saw a flyer. This is New York City for a woman teaching what she called natural birth control. And again, this wasn't very innocent age. You could not look this stuff up. (laughs) So so my roommate and I, who were inclined to all things natural at the time, decided to go and check it out. And, you know, the rest is history. We we had our minds blown and uh, I learned fertility awareness. And like so many other people that have learned it, I became very enthusiastic about it and remained interested um, eventually beyond my my role just as a practitioner. Mm -hmm. Well, and you began teaching in 2001. Yes. Officially. Um, And so I don't know if you wanted to to talk about that a little bit, but um, maybe, yeah, what happened in between discovering it and then becoming a teacher? I love to talk about it because it gives me the opportunity to get the name of my mentor out there. Um, The woman who taught me was named Barbara Feldman. And she was one of the first people to teach fertility awareness She was colleagues with Tony Weschler and Geraldine Mattis and a number of other women who were really pioneers and laid the groundwork for all of us. And I was privileged to study with her. We lived in the same neighborhood. We would run into each other at political events and things like that. And Barbara struggled with cancer for many, many years. 
and treated it in a way that was so different than anything I'd ever seen before. Her own mother had succumbed at 44. She had a very strong familial history of breast cancer. And Barbara decided that she was not going that route. So she ate a very, very, very innovative, mostly raw vegan diet. She exercised. She took amazing care of herself. And she did make it to 54 and had a really good quality of life. But all the time I knew her, she uh, had this, um, this lump. And in 2000, it was 2000, she started to get sick. And Barbara and I had always been friends. And she always wanted me to work with her because I ran a large business. I was good at that. And she felt that, you know, my business acumen would be helpful for her practice. And I was enthusiastic about the method. But it just never worked out because I was busy with my own business. And um, then in 2000, when she got sick, she reached out to me and said, you know, we need to talk about this. And um, at that point, I began working with her with an eye toward being her partner if she should survive and taking over her practice if she should not. And unfortunately, she did die in 2001. And at that point, I found myself with her practice. Wow, that's quite the story of how you kind of fell into the practice. I find that it's Unfortunately, you know, when I ask the question of how did you find yourself in the work, there's quite a high percentage of people that have found their way into the professions that they do one way or another through tragedy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it's it's really common and it's kind of eerily common, actually, mm-hmm. um, just given after doing so many interviews. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I'd love then for you to talk a little bit about what's happened between then and now and also your role in the Association for Fertility Awareness Professionals. Sure. That's kind of a large topic. Uh, A lot has changed, obviously, in terms of the awareness of fertility awareness, like the the proliferation of the internet, apps, the popularity of Tony Weschler's book. All these things have radically, radically changed the practice of fertility awareness, the number of people involved in it, the professional field, Uh, So there's all that, what's happened like in the general culture. And then there's my own path through the work. So where would you like to focus? Um, Well, I guess maybe we could talk a little bit about the development of the Association of Fertility Awareness Professionals. Right. Why it was created, I guess, what is the Mm -hmm. vision behind it and Mm -hmm. the intention for it? Sure. Great place to start. So one of the things that Barbara did was she ran... A network at the time it was called the Fertility Awareness Network. And she and those other pioneers in the field had gotten together because the infrastructure of fertility awareness taught in a religious context, what we generally refer to as natural family planning here in North America, that infrastructure was strong. It had the church and there was funding and there were outlets for instruction and there was standardized teaching and all that. The people who taught in non-religious contexts, there was no central central infrastructure. So those teachers got together, again, pre-internet, <laughs> and they tried to do this to, to make themselves a, a kind of a professional body. Uh, Tony Weschler talks a little bit about this on her blog recently, about how they literally would like have these manuscripts that they would mail to each other. So that, you know, in the time periods before they could get together, because they all lived in very different states and even countries, they would just mail stuff. (laughs) It was really beautiful and do phone trees and stuff like that. So when Barbara, um, when we were in our transition phase, she told me about this network, which had largely become defunct at that point. And she was also aware that Tony Weschler's book did not contain any non-religious resources. And this was a source of great frustration for her. So the time had come for her to introduce me to Tony. So we called, we spoke with her, and Barbara said she got Tony to agree that if I would put the Fertility Awareness Network back together, that Tony would list them in the next edition of the book as a resource for people. So I had that on my plate. Mm-hmm. So I, I tried to put it together as best I could. Um, many of the Senior teachers in the field helped me. Katie Singer helped me write the material. I I reached out to everyone. It was a great way for me to get to know these women, actually, and laid the foundation for AFAP many years later. 
FAN never really took off. We had one conference during those years, I believe, but for the most part, it was very, it just didn't find its feet. So long story short, I went to graduate school from um, 2011 to 2013. And by the time I got out, many of my colleagues were really itching to have some kind of professional association, to have more support, to have more standardization. And I was asked to assist and because I am an organizer. I mean, that's always what I've done. And it's also what I studied in graduate school. I helped with the creation of the Association of Fertility Awareness Professionals, kind of steward at its birth. And now I'm the executive director. And now we are a very strong organization at its inception with a lot of interesting long-term goals that I invite everyone to, to look at our mission, vision, and goals on our website, which is the um, fertilityawarenessprofessionals.com. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk to you about anything in particular that we're doing. But the basic idea is that we want to unify and strengthen the profession of fertility awareness education. And we want to empower the public to have better access to this information through, as I said, standardization and transparency about what it is to be certified, what body of knowledge do practitioners have to have, and helping practitioners to be stronger by providing professional community. So one of the things that really surprised me about the podcast in general is that I never really anticipated to have my peers listening. When I first started the podcast, it was just me in my basement. And I thought, okay, maybe I can help some women to learn, you know, about the fertility awareness method and also the impact of the whole health angle and how your chart can be used as a tool, obviously, to let you know if there's something going on. But, you know, when I thought about this, when I first started it, I didn't actually think that health professionals would be listening to <laughs> at all. It didn't occur to me. It didn't cross my mind one time. And um, so I guess in terms of the Association for Fertility Awareness Professionals, for the listeners who actually are fertility awareness educators or some of the listeners who are aspiring to be, because I get a lot of emails from women saying, you know, I've been inspired by this work and I'd really love to learn more. And, you know, could you tell me who teaches it? Because I, I, I kind of want to become a fertility awareness educator. Why is it important to have this type of professional certification or this professional membership with regards to fertility awareness education? Mm. I'm so glad you asked that. There is definitely a difference of opinion in the community about this. There has been a long-held belief that fertility awareness is women's right, that it can be approached as a DIY kind of thing, um, that because everyone has a right to this knowledge, that there don't need to be gatekeepers to this knowledge. And while I completely understand that sentiment. I don't agree with it. Uh, I think there are many practical problems therein. And for some people, I'll just say for some people that self-education, that community aspect is going to work. But if we want to have a future, if we want to be respected and understood by other professional communities like the healthcare community, if we want the misconceptions about fertility awareness in the public sphere to be eradicated, if we want women to have consistently high quality access, access to consistently high quality education, if we want to find, to grow as professionals, um, we have to create a profession like any other profession. And that's what AFAP is committed to. We're having wonderful discussions about standardization and the lack of standardization in the field. And we're coming, we're having really good productive conversations about what is the intrinsic knowledge that all educators have to have. And so um, we are now almost at the end of a two-year process of creating what we're calling core competencies for certification. And this for the first time will outline what many different educators believe is the core body of knowledge that a fertility awareness educator needs to have so everyone can see it. And that in and of itself will, I think, be a big boon, both to professionals in the field who are wondering, do I know what I need to know? What are my weak areas, etc.? 
as well as to the public who can make an informed decision as to whether they want to work with someone who is certified or not and what the distinction is between those two. Mm -hmm. I think you raised such a good point, which is that because I believe that every woman is entitled to to this information, that it somehow means that the knowledge itself or the application of it is necessarily simple. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like the interesting thing about fertility awareness is that it is simple after you've Mm -hmm. learned, like after you've figured it out. And I think, Mm -hmm. you know, to use the analogy of standard driving is a good one. And I often use it with, with clients. And, you know, even on the podcast, because yeah, I've driven my standard car for 10 years. It's super easy. But let me tell you, the first six months of that was a hot mess. And then add to that analogy, that's your car. You know how your car works. But somebody else is going to come in and like, oh, their air filter shot or they don't have any, you know, brake fluid or whatever. It's a totally different thing. And just because you as an individual know how to drive your car really well doesn't mean that you're capable of teaching somebody else how to care for or drive their car. Mm -hmm. I love I love that addition to my analogy. And I'm going to to, feel free to add and feel that. (laughs) Thank you. Um, Well, so I'm getting to a question, but I I recently had an interview where I was interviewed and uh, this uh, this woman was interviewing me for her book and she was talking about a lot of different reproductive health issues. And so one of the questions that she posed to me, so she's asking me questions about fertility awareness and I was explaining and in my true fashion, you know, I'm explaining and my explanations are lengthy. And, and at one point she said, you know, how can you say that it's fairly simple to learn if there's all this detail? And that question, I think, will always stay with me because Mm -hmm. there is all this detail. Mm -hmm. Um, And one other point, um, in a recent interview that I had with Dr. Carrie Hampton, she shared some of her research. And basically, her research was showing her she's done a lot of research on um, how accurately a woman can identify her fertile window. Mm-hmm. And essentially what her research said was unless a person is an actual fertility awareness educator, <laughs> they're really not reliably able to accurately pinpoint their their fertile window. And so for all of the podcasts that I've done and talking about how you know straightforward and simple it is, there's a lot to it. So I, I, would, I know that that's kind of a long kind of outline there, but I'd love for you just to talk about um, the idea that it's just really simple or the idea that just like you said, just because I can chart my own cycle, it means I can necessarily teach everybody else how to chart theirs. Well, I'm going to have to look at that um, podcast because I want to know, and maybe you know the answer to this, who were the people she interviewed? Were they people who are participating in a public group, like on Facebook or one of the forums associated with the apps, or were they people who had been trained by a fertility awareness instructor? Because I can pretty much guarantee you that if she had interviewed one of my students, they would have been able to accurately identify their fertile window. Well, she was, um, it's, she, the, the women who she, um, who she interviewed for her survey were women who were accessing services for infertility. So these were women who had been trying to, so not necessarily had probably hadn't received fertility awareness education, but had specifically been trying to conceive oftentimes for many years to the point that they're at a fertility clinic looking at assisted reproductive technology. So if anybody you would assume would have a better idea of their menstrual cycle, independent of fertility awareness education, you would think that a woman who's been trying to get pregnant for the last two or three years would know. No, unfortunately, that's not the case. The the level of, of, uh, ignorance around how fertility actually works is really quite high. And unfortunately, it's supported by the medical profession. So many of my students, the vast majority of my students who go to their healthcare practitioners with the charts are rejected, like the charts are not used. Whether they're trying to get pregnant, whether they're trying to avoid pregnancy, it doesn't matter. The charts have no utility. They're not accurate, blah, blah, blah. So if the medical profession doesn't believe in it and doesn't support it, how is a woman on her own supposed to be doing this, you know, without some kind of support? So I'm not, I'm not really not at all surprised by her findings. So you want to know how, how um, a woman could well, yeah, I guess just to speak to because um, to talk a little bit about the Association for Fertility Awareness Professionals and why it's necessary then to have this kind of professionalization 
in the mm-hmm. field. Sure. Um, you know, why is it that any, any woman can't just teach fertility awareness if she can kind of chart her own cycles? Oh, good heavens. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the people who are certified to teach fertility awareness typically take about two years to get there. There is a lot to learn. And unfortunately, people don't know what they don't know. That's the nature of ignorance. So, I mean, I can't put it any more simply than that. <laughs> you may think you know everything there is to know, and you may have read every book about it, but you don't. And there is just some stuff that has to be learned over time by working with clients in a supervised manner because stuff comes up. And that's the other thing. In working with clients, it is not simply about being able to read their charts. And one of the most disturbing things that I see when I look at, I try not to, but when I look at public forums and I see people putting up their charts and other people discussing and commenting on them, is the complete lack of context and the lack of counseling and just these comments. Like, um, <laughs> so I was I was listening to an interview with Jimmy Whalen, is that his name? I'm going to get it wrong. Like one of the co-founders of Wikipedia. And someone, a celebrity who had been, of course, has a Wikipedia entry about himself on Wikipedia said, those are the facts, but it's not the truth. And that's often the case with the fertility awareness chart. You need to look beyond what is on the chart. You need to be doing it in a counseling context. Otherwise, you're going to miss very important, you may miss very important information. And that's the sort of thing that comes when you're trained to be an instructor, not when you just read a lot of books and look at charts online and learn everything you can about like temperature rises. There's far far more to it than that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about some of the things that do come up when you're working with clients, some of the things that um, might have surprised you from when you first learned about fertility awareness back in 94, you learned it was a thing, and then you started charting your own cycles. What were some of the things that surprised you that came up in working with clients that you wouldn't have thought about before? Hmm. Interesting. Um, Well, I was blessed with very, very, very regular cycles. And my fertility was like a red flag that came up every month. Like, hello, fertile. There was really no mistaking it. And so, you know, when I saw women with really difficult cycles and charts that were hard to understand, and it seemed as though they were doing everything right, that was very perplexing for me. Uh, It took me a while to sink into that and to really learn how to approach those different types of challenges. And I think what's interesting to me now uh, is how little concern there is for privacy, <laughs> how, how people just put up their charts with all that juicy information on the internet and then let complete strangers comment about it just boggles my mind. But you know, th- I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, I would never in a million years do that. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Uh, I think you you touched on this too, of just how much things have changed since mm-hmm. you have started learning. And so this morning, I got an email from one of my past guests. And she was asking me if I had an example of, so for myself, I, I had a thyroid uh, issue, and I still do. And so she wanted to know, like, do I have an example of a, a woman who had thyroid issues that were not addressed and what her charts look like? Mm -hmm. And then who then had those issues addressed and then what her charts look like after for kind of clinical reference teaching purposes to show what it could look like Mm -hmm. if you do and then when it's fixed. And so then I was thinking back because I was like, you know, I don't have um, a client example, but I have my own. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But I have to find my physical copy of my the the book that I used to that I made. I used to make books Mm -hmm. (laughs) and print them out and do it on paper. So and now it's a completely different beast. Mm-hmm. Um, some women still do and enjoy charting on paper. And I do still believe that paper is the best way to learn mm-hmm. because then you have to physically put your stuff down. You have to mm-hmm. know what it is mm-hmm. because, yeah, your app isn't telling you. And then you actually have to kind of take a ruler and draw your baseline so that you know yes. when you ovulate and stuff like that. Anyway, so, yeah, just when you mentioned that, the difference, how how much things have, have changed do you think that it's kind of for the like, do you think it's for the better or for the worse now that we have all of this access? I think it's I, like it is great that we have access to all of this information. And in theory, it's really great that you can just Google anything and go online and find a group of women who are also charting and ask your questions. <laughs> um, do you think it's all bad? Mm, no, definitely not. As with all things, 
that have been impacted by technological change in the last 20 years or so, there are definite pros and definite cons. And, you know, the popul- the increased popularity of fertility awareness is all to the good. What's happening around women's periods, that public conversation that's taking place, the destigmatization, the increased thirst for knowledge about cycles is fantastic. That's all great. The problem is that there is so much bad information out there. Women have no way to discern between what's accurate, what's not accurate. And fertility awareness has always struggled with legitimacy. It's always struggled with the question of effectiveness. That's what's being harmed. A woman who practices fertility awareness based on inadequate instruction is not likely to have the same effectiveness rate if her goal is to avoid pregnancy as a woman who studies it with a trained instructor. This has been demonstrated by studies. Um, Not that they put the two groups side by side, but every study that has come out with a very high effectiveness rate has been based on a standardized method of instruction. And that's not getting across to people. Yes, it can be beautifully simple, but you need to be taught by someone who has a good deal of information and training and instruction. In a lot of ways, I love what's happening. I I think the future is secure. The method's not going to die and people are embracing it and doing wonderful things with it. We need not to get confused and think that this is something that everyone can teach themselves. Again, some people will be okay with that. Some people will not be. I think that part of it and especially as, you know, a budding fertility awareness educator myself, I think part of it is that people don't really know what you do. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't really, and it's it's true, they don't really know what you do. Because mm-hmm. if it's just as simple as, you know, pointing out when you have cervical mucus and when you don't, then what do I need to <laughs> mm-hmm. have an, educate, an educator for? And so, I mean, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. It's kind of hard because it's kind of like this gray thing, but how do you approach that with clients and especially with the professional organization? How do you explain that, what fertility awareness educators do and why it's a necessary service? Mm. Well, the people that come to me, if someone reads a book like Taking Charge of Your Fertility or The Garden of Fertility and she gets it and she can chart her cycles and everything is working happily for her, she's not likely to contact me. Similarly, if somebody's very happy with her pill or IUD, she's not likely to contact me. The people that I see are the people that have, for the most part, already decided that they want someone to walk with them as they learn this. So I don't really have to do a sell for my services for the most part or for the value of fertility awareness instruction. It's a conversation that hasn't yet been held between, as I said, kind of the DIY support group community and the professional community. And right now, I think we're just kind of in separate silos Mm-hmm. Well, and I think one of the interesting topics that has been touched on throughout the different interviews I've done as well is that problematic nature of having separate camps and and kind of creating this uh, us and them type of situation when we're all trying to work towards the same goal. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, hopefully in the future, we can create that kind of inclusive environment where mm-hmm. if a person does start a DIY community, I mean, it would be nice to have kind of a bridge where we can mm-hmm. support each other. And mm-hmm. that, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm not sure. I guess it's it's a hard topic to talk about. But one of the topics that you wanted to, to touch on as well, um, and I'm really excited to talk about, is reproductive justice. So I'd love for you to kind of share with us what your kind of definition of reproductive justice is and why it's important. Within the context of fertility awareness or? Um, We could start within the context of fertility awareness and then kind of broaden. Okay. This is, again, kind of a big topic. Reproductive justice has been defined in a number of different ways. I generally think of it as the intersection of social justice and reproductive rights. So the reproductive rights movement had been pretty focused on the right to abortion and to choices around pregnancy, fertility management. And without going into a whole history of the reproductive justice movement, it started around the early 90s. People of color got together and said, you know what, this is not speaking for me. This is not speaking for our experience. This is not addressing all of our concerns. And they created this concept of reproductive justice. Uh, which has now been expanded to include 
basically all areas that impact the intersection of human rights and reproduction, whether it's parenting, like who has the right to parent, what access to health care do we have? The emphasis is, is a lot on access as opposed to choice, because choice comes from a position of privilege and access is, a, is kind of a lower bar. That was a big, very loose representation of what reproductive justice is, and I hope I haven't done it a disservice. But AFAP is committed to this. It's enshrined in our founding documents. I feel that the fertility awareness community has an obligation to participate in this work. And I am so happy that my colleagues in AFAP agree with me and are equally committed to this work. Um, and we are, going, we are at the forefront of the movement to integrate reproductive justice with fertility awareness work. And so when you talk about that, is it the idea that women need, um, not only have the right to, but access to particular services? Is that, or does it, is it more than that? It's many things. It's many things. If you think about all the issues that affect people who have been historically oppressed and which of those issues can be tied to the broad area of reproduction, you think about access to abortion, right? When, that's the, the basic one. We'll start there. When abortion becomes limited in terms of its geographic locale or its cost, who still has access to it? right? People with money, people of privilege. When healthcare services are cut at places like Planned Parenthood, who stops getting pap smears? People of color, people that don't have money, people that can't get away from work to get to another healthcare facility, etc. When you look at parenting, who gets to parent? Who gets their children taken away from them? Who has their custody rights contested? Who experiences far, far greater rates of incarceration and is not able to parent their children? You know, the list just goes on of all the issues in which people experience inequity. Right? That's what it's basically about, disparity in health care and where that falls along the spectrum of reproductive health care services. Uh, breastfeeding. Who gets to breastfeed for longer periods of time? Women who don't have to go back to work right away. Who is that? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I could go on all day. <laughs> we have a limited amount of time. Well, and I... I think that as well, because you live in New York. And so, you know, the majority of my listener base is in living in the U.S. And in the U.S., things are, um, you could say, different <laughs> than they are in many of the other places in the world. And jarringly so in some cases. I've touched on this, you know, on a few different podcasts, just the basic access to even health care. Um, mm -hmm that is not just not there for mm -hmm. American citizens. Um, mm -hmm. So <laughs> I recently yeah. watched this, uh, the new Michael Moore documentary. Which one? Um, the new I one? think it's called Where to Invade Next. Is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the new one. Yeah. yeah so um, yeah. <laughs> that was a uh, real interesting. So if any of you've watched it, I'd love for you to jump in, jump <laughs> on the comments and let mm -hmm. me know what you thought. I'm guessing it's another one of those dividing lines. You're either totally game with what he's saying or you're not. But I thought that just coming off of that documentary, I felt like I needed a couple days just to kind of like, I don't know, take some deep breaths. Because it really actually pointed out as well the harsh realities to some degree of the U.S. Because as, as a Canadian citizen, it's, it's, it's different here. It's not rosy all the time, but it is different here. Well, I'm a huge Michael Moore fan, but I haven't seen that movie. So there, are there a particular couple of things that struck you that you want well, to share? Well, <laughs> I think um, part of it is uh, not fertility, you know, related. Part of it was as a mom, as a mom. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he went to Finland, I think. He went to a few different, he went to Finland, he went to France, but he went to a few different places and explored some of the interesting ways that these other countries uh, handle their education system. And it was just really striking. So one mm -hmm. of the examples that came to mind was, and again, this is, let me just put this into context for my listeners, why this is what stood out for me. So I have a three and a half year old who just started school in September. So this is probably the reason why this stood out to me in particular. But he gave the example of just, you know, how children are fed at school or not fed. And so, you know, here in Canada, where I live, there's no like school, I mean, 
there's some degree of school lunch program. But at the end of the day, as a parent, you just pack your kid lunch. And as you mentioned as well, so if you happen not to be in a good financial position and you can't afford to pack your kid lunch, then your kid probably goes to school hungry. But let's just say pack your kid lunch. But they sh- he showed this school in France where they had a chef who prepares the lunches for the Mm -hmm. students. And they prepare lunch in the same way that they would prepare food for adults. So there's no kids food. It's Mm -hmm. adult food. Mm -hmm. Um, They have, and it's really high end, like restaurant grade food to the point where the chef has a monthly meeting with all of the staff, including some representatives from the city who come and a nutritionist. And they talk about the menu. They make sure it meets the nutritional guidelines. And so they actually hash out the meals monthly. Mm, to awesome. The, yeah. So, I mean, that's just one example. There's yeah. many. Um, there's a lot of re- injustice type issues that come up as well. And just the stark difference between what's possible and what's mm-hmm. being done in other places in the world versus what's happening in the States is just, it's like too much to handle. Yes. How we feed our children is an aspect of reproductive justice, whether or not they have clean water to drink. What's happening in Flint, that is com- what happened, what is continuing to happen in Flint with the lead in the water, is completely an issue of reproductive justice. The pipeline that those people are bravely trying to block right now is an issue of reproductive justice because if there's no clean water, you can't raise your children. You know, It's all related. It's a very, very broad concept. Um, fertility awareness is a piece of it, but one of our goals is is to bring it to people's attention in general so that they can think about it and think about how it intersects with their life, as you just did with respect to your own child. Mm-hmm. Well, it really, and I think also to see what's possible. Um, so the, the example that just tears me up the most, again, as um, a mom uh, of a I'm a one-year-old. My my son just t- turned one. Uh, and as a resident of Canada, you know, who was fortunately, you know, employed, I have a job. <laughs> in Canada, you have maternity leave for a year. And I've said that on the mm. podcast for uh, like many times. So not every single person in Canada gets maternity leave for a year if you don't work. So if you, if you don't work a certain amount of hours, then you wouldn't qualify. But if you do work a certain number of hours, then your employer is required to hold your job for 12 months if you choose to take the whole thing. I mean, if if you think about it, you're not going to get the same amount of money as you do, you know, when you're working. So you're going to get less money when you're on this maternity leave. But if you can afford to, you can, that's your, like, you can take up to 12 months and it is paid, although it's not necessarily paid to what you were receiving before. And it's like to my horror that I've discovered, you know, that our, my U.S. neighbors just absolutely do not get this. That's like the land of Oz to people in the U.S. I mean, that's almost inconceivable. You know, the, the majority of women in the U.S. are back to work. I wish I had the statistic in front of me. I don't, but it's something like less than two weeks. And I think for a lot of them, it's like six days. I mean, it's insane. Well, and to me, that's like, well, I'm, I'm not going to say what I was thinking, but to me, that's like, again, it's, it's a horrifying um, so, for example, and it, this co- this has come into like into my life just a few like in so many different ways. Whether it's guests that I've had on the show who have also recently have ba- had babies, and their babies are a lot younger than mine, and they are at work already. And even my family, so I have family that you know lives in the states, and my s- sister in law, she's headed back to work. Uh, she's already back to work, but I remember having this conversation with her, you know, when her son was ten months old. Or 10 weeks old, sorry, 10, of course I say 10 months because I'm in Canada (laughs) and I can't conceive of it, 10 weeks old when she's like, yeah, I'm back to work in two weeks, right? Because that's 12 weeks, that's three months. So, And we don't have universal childcare. So then there's the issue of what to do with your kid. And then, you know, again, who gets to be in the nice, (laughs) licensed, healthy, safe childcare facilities and who's dropping their kids off with grandma, you know? Well, and I'm, you know, I'm really good at the ranties, but where do we go from here? So in terms of the role, I guess, of the Mm -hmm. Association of Fertility Awareness Professionals, Mm -hmm. where, how do you see that organization actually moving towards raising awareness, but also changing some of these issues? It's a pretty tall order. Yeah. Um, Where do you start? 
Yeah, I'm so glad you asked. Um, we actually have currently a page about this on our website. And as I said, we are at the beginning, right? We are a young organization. We're a few years old. We have a long way to go which we will get to through increased membership and participation of members, because this is completely a membership organization. All the members do the work. There's no paid staff. And, um, but we, we are laying groundwork and making plans for what we want to do. So the Reproductive Justice Committee is very active. Um, maybe in future there can be another podcast in which we talk more specifically about reproductive justice and have more people on to talk about it because I'm by no means an expert. But what we've outlined thus far, it kind of falls into two categories, um, a number of categories, actually. We want to continue educating ourselves and our colleagues. So we're, we are going to have continuing education in general in the organization. We're we are doing that. We're going to continue doing more of it. And we're going to have some of those presentations and educational events be specifically about for the issues of reproductive justice so that we can keep growing. And so this, this knowledge and awareness will filter down to our practices. It's very, very important for us that this work be implemented practically. Um, we are, as professionals in the field... I don't know if every, I don't know how common this concept is, but gatekeepers. So we sort of determine who enters the field, who doesn't enter the field, who's considered a professional, who's not, who receives services, who doesn't. It is incumbent upon us. It is our responsibility to make sure that the education that people have access to this information, that everyone who wants to can become an instructor so that the information can go back into communities where it's needed, right? We, we have to do that. We, the nature of institutionalized oppression is that if you keep doing the same thing, the oppression continues. Like you may see yourself as a very open-minded person, very progressive, whose practice is open to anyone. I'm not saying you as a you, Lisa, mm -hmm. but just you, you in the general second person sense. You don't discriminate. What's the problem? The problem is, as Howard Zinn says, you're on a moving train. The train is going in a certain direction. Society is set up to continue what it's doing. So in order to change what's happening, you have to get off the train. You have to take a stand. And so that's what we're trying to bring awareness to. Like, you got to recognize your role in this institution and take action to make a change. So one way is through education. Another is to partner with other organizations that are actively working on issues of reproductive justice. Um, we hope to increase accessibility to good information about fertility awareness through outreach. And finally, we want to create a scholarship fund for people who might not otherwise be able to afford the cost of training so that they can become certified instructors. This is something that I'm particularly excited about, and the members of the organization are all really in support of it, too. Mm -hmm. Well, those are some, I think those are some really great practical ways, because it's hard. I think when issues seem so big, um, mm -hmm. yes. then it feels like there's nothing that you can do. And of course, it made, it made me think about the documentary again, because I think what one of the things that he uh, showed Michael Moore in his documentary, which I think is called Where to Invade Next, is just, you know, these countries that have these, it's almost mythical when you're watching some of the stuff. So, you know, Eileen, I want you to watch it. And then, you know, if you have time, <laughs> send me an email. Oh, I will. I will. There was a part where they, um, where was it? See, and I'm, I don't remember exactly where it might have been Norway. Um but he went into a country and uh, they showed their prison system. And mm -hmm. uh, oh, my goodness. Like, I can't even explain to you. It was like Oz, like what you mm -hmm. said. It was like I went to sleep <laughs> and had a dream. And I'm mm -hmm. talking about their maximum security prison mm -hmm. because the concept, the way that they treat their prisoners, they treat them like human beings. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they treat them totally different than anything that we conceive of here in North America. I've been mm -hmm. to jails and I have not been to the American jails. I've mm -hmm. been to Canadian jails because of mm -hmm. my educational background and the, the, you know, the practicums I did in university, etc. I've, I've been to um, some different institutions. And like I said, it's, it's like a trip to Mars. Mm. Um, 
And one of the interesting, so getting to my point of bringing that up, like the documentary, is that these countries that had these like mythical, <laughs> um, super just different ways of dealing with their societal kind of challenges, they didn't just happen um, at all. Mm-hmm. The people typically had to fight for them. And mm-hmm. so they show, like he also showed that aspect of things where when their rights were challenged and when the, you know, the government was like, okay, now we're going to charge you for education. The people stood up and mm-hmm. they, they picketed and they mm-hmm. protested and they, they fought. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is um, the hard, like, I think that's a hard part of, of the world that we're living in now. I think we're, a lot of us um, are pretty comfortable um, you know, like you come home, you have mm-hmm. a little TV and got yeah. our cool iPhones and stuff. Yes. So we're pretty comfortable. So the thought of like t- putting on our shoes and going into the street with a sign and fighting for something. Yes. Um, or even just the thought that this is just how it is and it's always going to be this way. Mm-hmm. I don't know how you get past that. Like earlier when we were talking about you don't know what you don't know, it's Privilege works the same way. People who have privilege don't tend to recognize that they have privilege. And so they're not motivated to go out and do something about it because it's just the way life is. So awareness is always the first step, right? So you always start at the baseline of education. And then ideally, you also offer ways for people to get engaged. And people also go off and get engaged on their own and do amazing things. And they can bring that back to us and show us how to make changes it's really important not to feel overwhelmed. It is a very big, you know, topic. There are a lot of problems. Um, if people go where their inclination, passion, heart leads them, they'll find an area in which they can make a difference. And I hope that AFAP can be part of the solution and offer people a pathway to making a difference. Well, and as, you know, as you were saying that, I thought of something. And so back in, you know, 1994, when you went to, when you found that, that pamphlet back Mm -hmm. in the day when people used paper to communicate. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But back in the day when someone handed you that pamphlet and you went to that talk, you know, the woman who led that talk, I'm pretty sure she didn't think about the impact that she would have kind of globally, because look at Mm. what you're doing now. Mm. And so I I often think of that. And so my hope, uh, especially for the podcast, I mean, part of this whole cool, you know, newfangled way to communicate worldwide from my basement, which is so awesome, um, (laughs) is that you just never know who it's going to touch and how that uh, interaction could change the world. So, you know, from my basement, hopefully, you know, sharing these ideas, like you said, through education. I, my hope is that it makes a difference in the world, that it makes an impact. You kind of start with the little ripples mm, and eventually exactly. someone's going to get real pissed off <laughs> and they're going to do something that's going to make a difference exactly. even beyond what we ever could have thought. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think that's why we're so excited about the scholarship fund because we don't know who's going to get that scholarship and we don't know what they're going to do. But I know even before we've even created it, that they're going to be amazing people. Well, and exactly what you said about um, creating opportunities for individuals who live in other places of the world to Mm -hmm. take this information and improve Mm -hmm. their communities. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the interviews that I did that really struck me just from that perspective was um, the interview that I did about the standard days method, Mm -hmm. especially coming from a, you know, justice background, I'm thinking standard days, that sounds like rhythm. But Uh the way that she talked and she's, or the way that she spoke about the impact that this can have in communities where their only other alternatives for um, contraceptives are potentially, you know, hormonal or disrupting their health and different things for a lot of um, women in what she called low resource settings, this was like a a godsend in a way. Mm. Um, So I think what you're, what you're sharing is kind of that having that global kind of taking it out of our own privilege and our own Mm -hmm. situations and our own countries and really thinking about how this can impact women all over the world and not Mm -hmm. having barriers for them to access that education. I think that's a wonderful way to start. Thanks. 
So as we come to close today, I am sure that there's a lot of other things that we could have talked about. Was there anything else that you wanted to leave the, the listeners with or anything that you really want the listeners to take from our conversation today? Let's see, it was such a broad ranging conversation. <laughs> I'm not sure that there was a particular theme. No, I just, I wanted to make them, I, I definitely wanted to talk about reproductive justice. It's a privilege to have an opportunity to talk about that in, um, you know, a very public setting. So thank you for that. And it's great to be getting the word out about AFAP because we're a new organization. And uh, so I think a lot of your listeners would definitely be people who would be interested in joining us or affiliating with us. Um, and the work about certification also keep tuned. It's going to be blowing up soon. We've been working really, really hard and um, I have great hopes for where that's going. Well, and as I mentioned at the top of the interview, you know, a lot of the listeners are fertility awareness educators or aspiring educators. So for those of, uh, you know, the women listening who are kind of wondering, what is the certification process like? How do you become a member? Mm -hmm. uh, what does it mean for their business or their, you know, their work? Maybe you could just kind of touch on that a little bit. Sure. Okay. Um, there are currently two paths to certification. So, so to back it up a step, Previously, you could be certified by Justice. You could be certified by Sarah's program, currently called Grace of the Moon. You could be certified by Michal's program in Israel. You could be certified by Sense of Plan. I mean, there's many, many different independent certification programs. And there's also the Natural Family Planning Certification programs. And, um, but there was no one certification. So that's what we're in the process of creating. It's an international certification for people who teach in a non-religious context. And it's not an either or. So we've already recognized three training programs. That's um, Justice, Grace of the Moon, and Michal's program. And people who graduate from those programs automatically have the AFAP certification or, or can have it um, because that their, those programs are recognized. Uh, we definitely hope to expand the list of training programs that we recognize in future. So that's, that's path A. And then the second path will be certification by AFAP for people who are going independently, maybe people who are already um, teaching or feel qualified to teach or are in the process of getting to a point where they'd like to teach. Um, that certification process does not yet exist. We're taking this step by step, and the first thing we did was create the core competencies, as I said, just deciding as a kind of diverse group, what did we feel was critical knowledge for an entry-level fertility awareness instructor. So we're going to publish this soon, and once we do, people will be able to walk through it and see, as I said, where they feel they're, they're in a good position to meet the criteria and where they still have some learning to do. Our next step after the publication of this document, will be to create the certification process itself. And that is going to take another couple of years. I mean, this is a big task, but we will get there. As I said, we have long-range goals for the organization. And then uh, hopefully we can start certifying people who, are, who choose not to attend a formal training program. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds exciting. I think that it's really interesting. And it'll be really interesting to kind of watch as the years go by, um, what the organization turns into. Thank you. I also want to add one other thing about our certification icon. This will start showing up on people's websites. You'll already see it appearing on a number of teachers' websites. So for people who have been certified by the organization, they can display um, the certified by AFAP icon on their website. And that tells people we want it to be recognized as a symbol of excellence so that People looking for fertility awareness instructors can see this and begin to recognize it as like, oh, I'm in good hands here. This person has been recognized by an international professional organization, so I'm good to go. And also for people, we're, we're not going to talk a lot about benefits of membership, but they can be found on our website. People can also contact us if they have information. We have a list of educators on our website, so members are listed and people coming to the website can search for educators using a variety of criteria. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like I should complete my application process. I feel like this is like real time, like, okay, Lisa, on, on with it now. I need to become a member. <laughs> I think I can safely say that we would expedite your membership. Aw, thanks. 
<laughs> All right. Well, I'm just going to ask a few questions like I typically do at the end of the episode. What would you say is the biggest myth about fertility that you would like to see corrected? God, there's so many. You can get pregnant at any day of your cycle if you're heterosexually active, that you can get pregnant at any age, that infertility is rare. Mm-hmm. Those are my top three. Yeah, those are, those are good and very common. What advice, if any, would you give to a couple who is struggling to conceive? I need to know more about the situation because <laughs> I wouldn't give advice without knowing more about their situation. I think that's a really good answer because then basically you're saying it's just not that simple. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the problem with what I see. I, I hate to, to belabor the point because as we said earlier, there are good things about people finding community, but that is the problem when you throw up a chart and ask people to comment on it. So you are missing the context. Yeah. Because when, what I have experienced is that when someone puts up a chart and asks questions and says like, what's going on, put it into context. The only thing that I can do is ask more questions. Yeah. So as soon as I see a chart, I have 10 questions. Yeah. Maybe yeah. 15, possibly yeah. 20. Yeah. And only after we've like, it would, it, yeah. Exactly. It just even, you know, they take a simple thing like this, the cervical mucus observations. They're always taken at face value. Like that's what her cervical mucus was. How do you know? Did you talk to her about her method of observation and recording? You know, you're, you're starting from a false premise. So yeah, exactly. 20 to maybe even 30 questions, <laughs> maybe more. So you'll have to join and participate in our next chart review. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Okay, and final question of the day, and this might fall. This might have the same answer as the last question, but I'm still going to ask it. For a woman who is currently on the pill and doesn't want to get pregnant, but is thinking about it within the next two to three years, what if any advice would you give to her? Yeah, so I don't give advice. I, you know, I'm I'm a social worker. I start from the clients where the client is. I listen to the person's concerns and then I respond to them and help them reach an informed decision that's right for them. I love that. Well, I think those are great words to end on. Eileen, I just want to thank you so much for being here today. This was such a great conversation. I think that the listeners, especially the listeners who have ever thought about becoming a fertility awareness educator themselves or any of the educators who are happen to be listening to this episode, I think this is just a great conversation to get started, one that we don't often have the opportunity to have. And so I'm really happy that uh, you were here today for us to have it. It was totally my pleasure. Thank you very much. Well, and we did talk a lot about, you know, the website information, but just so that the listeners know where to go for more information, maybe you could direct them. Sure. So my personal website is fertaware.com, F-E-R-T-A-W-A-R-E.com. The website of AFAP is fertilityawarenessprofessionals.com. Those are the two I think they need, right? Yeah. Well, and your site is lovely. I'm not sure when you recently, if it was recent, when you had it updated. I am very happy to say I got a lovely, a very generous grant from the Puffin Foundation, which enabled me to relaunch my website and my designer rocks. Look her up. (laughs) Yes, yes. I couldn't help but notice because, I mean, I've gone to your site many times throughout the years. And then so recently when I went, I was like, ooh, this is pretty. Um, I so appreciate that. It was a long time coming. (laughs) Anyone who hasn't seen my site in a long time and was embarrassed on my behalf for the old site, please look at the new one. It's not quite finished. And one of the sections I need to fill in is the section about Barbara Feldman, my mentor. So um, we'll go in a circular fashion and end where we started by talking about Barbara. Thank you. Well, thanks again for being here. It was so much fun. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode at fertilityfriday.com slash 121. I hope you enjoyed my episode with Eileen Richman. It was such a treat to be able to chat with her and to really delve into the topic of reproductive justice and how fertility awareness plays into that conversation. And so if you enjoyed the episode or if you've been enjoying the podcast, please look for it on iTunes and leave a five-star review so that more people can find it. And I would really encourage you, if you love this episode or if there's another episode that really stood out for you, to please share it with a friend, uh, tag a friend, or even just email it. iTunes makes it super easy. I really appreciate all of you for leaving reviews. I do read every single review. And I appreciate all of you for sharing the podcast, spreading the word, talking about it. It's so funny when I run into people who say like, oh my goodness, I heard of your podcast because so-and-so told me or my physiotherapist told me about this podcast and that's how I found you. So all of your sharing and your word of mouth is really making a difference and I can see the impact that it has. 
in the exposure of the show and also in the download numbers. So I really appreciate all of you for helping me to spread the word. Because as you know, my passion is to share this with everybody. (laughs) So you all know the feeling of when you've discovered fertility writers for the first time, and you want to run out and tell everybody you know. And so this podcast came out of that feeling. (laughs) So thank you so much for helping me to spread the word. And if you do have an idea for a podcast episode or a topic that you'd like me to talk about on the show or a guest suggestion, please send me an email at info at fertilityfriday.com. I have some great shows coming up for you based on all of your feedback and suggestions, recommendations. I love it. So keep it coming. And also for more information for how to set up a one-on-one session with me or about the programs that I offer for fertility awareness, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash work with me. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I appreciate all of you for taking the time to tune into the podcast, whether you're commuting to work or if you're going for a walk, walking the dog, or if you are taking me uh, with you while you work out. I really appreciate you taking the time to let me be part of your day. And as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.